Well, welcome back. Uh, I hope you had a great discussion time. We were just finishing up uh, talking about the importance of, of fleshing out and determining uh, what the purpose of, of your sermon will be. And if you can think through, why am I preaching this sermon? Uh, what does God want to accomplish in the lives of my hearers through this biblical text and through the preaching of this biblical text? If you can uh, flesh that out, write that out, and do so in, in real measurable, uh, with a real measurable goals, uh, what, what you will find will happen is is you will be preaching in a far more concrete way, uh, looking for a specific response. And preaching for that response is going to make your sermon far more powerful and far more uh, productive. Uh, so you want to take the time, uh, once you develop your sermon idea, your homiletical idea, to then stop and ask yourself the question, why am I preaching this sermon? What uh, am I hoping that God will do in the lives of those who hear uh, through this sermon? Am I seeking to encourage? Uh, am I seeking to challenge? Uh, am, am I seeking through this biblical text to, to call people, to challenge people, to pray specifically for someone? Uh, am, am I is my purpose to move people to uh, take a step of confessing a sin and reconciling a relationship? Think about the text. Think about the purpose of the author of your text and when they wrote this. And, and then uh, develop your purpose statement. And, and then from that point on, you can begin to then uh, shape your sermon uh, to accomplish that purpose. And that's, uh, that's what we move into next. Uh, well, I mean, let me just touch on this as well. Uh, in determining the purpose of your sermon, uh, one thing that's, that's helpful to do is to write the conclusion of your sermon with your purpose in mind. Uh, you've preached your sermon, you've given the body of the sermon, now when you construct your conclusion of the sermon, uh, bring that purpose statement that you developed into your conclusion. Uh, an example of this, if, if you're preaching a sermon on uh, reconciliation, uh, uh, healing a, a broken relationship, and that's been the, the thrust of the text you're preaching, uh, in your, in your purpose of your sermon is to challenge people to, to take steps to restore a broken relationship, then your conclusion might sound something like this. Uh, is there someone with whom you have a broken relationship? As a follower of Jesus, you need to take the first step towards restoring that relationship. Is there a phone call you need to make? Is there a letter you need to write? Is there a person you need to go and talk to? Uh, God grants you the courage to obey and do what he calls you to do. And see, that is then taking the, the statement of purpose that you began with, bringing that into the conclusion, and, and that helps with the application of the sermon into the lives of your hearers. And so that's the importance of a purpose statement. If at the end of the sermon uh, no one knows uh, what your text has called them to do, no one knows uh, what your text has caused them to believe or to feel, uh, then your sermon has failed. If no one knows the purpose of your sermon by the time you've preached it, then the sermon has failed. That's how important a, ser a, a purpose is. So make sure you think through the purpose of your sermon before you preach it. So how do we accomplish then uh, the purpose of your sermon? How do you develop your sermon? And there's several ways you can do this. Uh, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because we don't have uh, a lot of time. Uh, but I just want you to be aware uh, that uh, 
that there are four major ways you can approach developing a sermon. And uh, the first arrangement in, the, in developing a sermon is what's called a deductive arrangement. In a deductive sermon, uh, the sermon idea is stated completely up front. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the sermon develops out of your stated sermon idea. So let me give you just one example. Uh, Romans 5, 6 through 11. Uh, let's just say that the sermon idea you come up with is, is God loves us. So you state that sermon idea. I'm going to talk to you today about God's love for us. And then from God loves us, that's the upfront big idea of the sermon. Then you begin to develop that idea. And, and perhaps uh, point one, God loves us. And from Romans 5, verses 6 through 11, this would be the points. God loves us by sending his son to die for our sins. Point two, God loves us when we are still sinning. Point three, God loves us by saving us from his wrath. And so again, uh, the idea, the sermon idea stated up front, God loves us, and then it's developed step by step as you move through the text. So the main idea of a deductive arrangement in your sermon, in a deductive sermon, you state your sermon idea up front, then develop the idea. In a deductive arrangement, uh, I'm sorry, an inductive arrangement uh, is just the opposite. Uh, in an inductive sermon, the introduction leads only to the first point of your sermon. Then strong transitions are used to link each new point to what came before, and then the sermon idea doesn't actually get stated or doesn't actually emerge until the end of the sermon in your conclusion. Uh, and again, don't worry so much about the definition. Let me just give you an example. And the example I'll give you is a sermon Peter preached, the first Christian sermon in Acts chapter 2. This was an inductive sermon. And what Peter did in Acts chapter 2 is he stated three points and then from those points uh, stated the sermon idea and the conclusion of his sermon. If you look at the sermon Peter preached in Acts 2, and take the time to do that uh, down the road, you'll find that, that Peter makes three points about Jesus. First, he says, Jesus was a man attested to you by God with mighty works and miracles. That was point one of Peter's sermon. Jesus is a man attested to you by God. Point two of Peter's sermon. Jesus was delivered up for crucifixion according to God's will. Jesus was delivered up for crucifixion according to God's perfect plan. Now, that was the second point of Peter's sermon. And then the third point of Peter's sermon was Jesus conquered death and rose from the grave. Jesus conquered death and rose from the grave. So Peter introduces one point, then point two, point three, and in each of those points, he's, he's building to uh, a statement of his sermon idea, the, the truth of the primary truth that the text is teaching. And so his big idea is given in his sermon conclusion. Again, Acts chapter 2. Uh, it was found in verse 36 is the big idea. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So this was an inductive form of a sermon. Uh, he gives the points first, and then the big idea comes last. Jesus, a man attested to you by God. Jesus, a man delivered for crucifixion according to God's plan. Jesus, a man who conquered death and rose from the grave. Therefore, let it be known, Israel, that Jesus, that God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. And so that's an example of an inductive form of a sermon. The other two forms um, that are on your study guide are really just a combination of inductive, deductive arrangement. I'll let you uh, study those out for yourself. You can find uh, information on the form sermon take in uh, Haddon Robinson's book. I believe it's in chapter 7. Uh, and so take a look there if you're interested in going more in depth into how to develop your sermon in terms of the form that it takes, deductive, uh, inductive, or, or a combination of, of the two. And so which brings us to then step eight.
of developing a sermon and that would be uh, to outline your sermon. So you have uh, chosen your passage, you, you've studied your passage, uh, you have uh, developed your sermon idea, uh, you have then uh, determined how you're going to approach the sermon by asking some developmental questions. Do I need to explain this? Do I need to prove this? Do I need to apply this? And then you have uh, developed your homiletical uh, statement, which is just a reworking of your sermon statement in a memorable form. And then you have determined your purpose for your sermon and then decided if you're how you're going to develop that sermon uh, to accomplish your purpose, which brings us to step number eight, which again is to outline the sermon now that, now that you work through those other steps. Having determined now whether you're going to develop the sermon in a deductive or inductive way or a combination, you're ready to outline. And the outline of a sermon, uh, it allows you to view your sermon as a whole. Uh, when you develop the outline, once you get that done, you can look at the outline and you can see if all the parts fit together uh, to present a unified message based on the central uh, idea of your text. So you can, uh, number two, you can visualize the relationship between the parts of your sermon by using an outline. Um, also, uh, developing an outline will enable you to crystallize uh, the order in which you want to present your ideas, uh, what's the major ideas, what's the minor points, uh, again, all pointing to or developing uh, your sermon idea. The outline also helps you recognize where your sermon, sermon is going to need some additional supporting material. So the outline then is really a way that you can visualize the shape that your sermon is going to take. Uh, I've a uh, listed in your notes and on you know some of the points in terms of of how to outline i think most people uh, are familiar with uh, how to do an outline a basic outline and i think i would just also say that uh, use a form of outline that works for you the 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 outline form i've used here is a somewhat formal roman numerals for your main points uh, capital letters for your subpoints and uh, and numbers uh, Arabic numbers for others for secondary subpoints and and that's a pretty standard form of outline but you know if, if you have another form that works for you uh, then use that form the main thing is to get a kind of a visual representation uh, of what your sermon is going to look like and how the sermon is going to flow uh, that outline will help you do that and will help you evaluate whether this is going to be effective or whether you need to rearrange some materials. So outlining is important and, uh, and it, it will help you greatly as you actually develop the sermon and it will help you especially with the logical flow of your sermon. And important to the logical flow of your sermon uh, as you outline is, is to work with transitions. Uh, now, in your outline, uh, I would suggest that you actually write out your transitions between uh, your major points of your sermon and between the major points and the subpoints of your sermon. Transitions are uh, the importance of a transition in your sermons almost can't be overstated in terms of of maintaining a logical flow to your sermon and making your sermon easy to listen to and easy to follow. So transitions are very important. Uh, again, transitions should be made between major sermon points and they should be planned out and written out in advance. Uh, let's look at some of the, uh, the marks of a good transition. Uh, a good transition it states or implies the logical connection between your introduction and the main body of your sermon and also the points of your sermon within the body of the sermon and then another transition another good transition needs to be present between the body of your sermon moving into your conclusion uh, so transition again establishes uh, a, a good logical flow as you move through your sermon
and, and makes your sermon easy to follow and the logic of your sermon. The second thing is a major transition uh, may require uh, as much as a paragraph to establish unity in your sermon, to order the points of your sermon, and to make a good, uh, a good easy flow of your sermon, a movement in your sermon. Uh, we've already said I think transitions should be written out and included in your outline. And uh, effective transitions are those transitions that remind your listeners of where you've been in the sermon and then uh, points them to the next point uh, that you're going to make in your sermon. So again, take them back to where you've been, move them forward to where you're going. Uh, effective transitions uh, number five, often review again where you've been, identify the new thought you're moving towards, relate what's already been said to the main sermon idea, and again it creates an interest in what's going to follow as you continue to preach through your message. So transitions are important. Again, I can't, uh, I can't overemphasize how important they are. Let me just actually uh, give you uh, maybe just one example of, of a transition and see what we're talking about in terms of referring to what's come before, pointing to what's about to come. Uh, Romans 5, 6 through 11, we've talked about that sermon, or at least a, a brief outline of the love of God and, and to develop that, uh, how God loves us. Let me just offer you uh, a transition uh, uh, towards the end, uh, between, actually between point two and point three of a sermon I once preached. Uh, the transition went something like this. Uh, Romans 5, verses 6 through 11, offers us an anatomy of God's love by answering three questions. First, how does God love us? Answer, God loves us by sending Jesus to die for us on the cross. Second, when did God love us in Christ? Answer, God loved us in Christ while we were still sinners. Which brings us now to the final question Paul answers in regards to God's love. What does God's love do for you and for me? So you see in that transition, I reviewed what had gone before and, and moved into what was going to come next. And, and that's the, the way a transition ought to work. So uh, let's then look to step nine then. Uh, once we have our outline done, a basic outline of the way we're going to develop the sermon, uh, how we're going to develop the big idea of the sermon, the transitions we're going to make between the major points of the sermon. Then we come to a place where we begin to fill in our sermon outline with supporting materials. And the end result will be a full-blown sermon. So you outline the sermon and then you fill in the sermon points with your supporting material. And uh, let me just go through uh, some of the ways, uh, none of these are going to be earth shattering or new to you, but just to think through how, what kinds of supporting material you can use to develop a sermon. Uh, the first way you can uh, develop a sermon is restatement. And I think in verbal communication, oral communication, uh, it's important to use restatement throughout, uh, throughout your sermon simply because uh, unlike reading a book, if you read a book and you lose a train of thought, you can, you can go back up a couple of paragraphs and, and reestablish your train of thought by rereading that portion of the book or the article. But when you're, when you're preaching, your hearer doesn't have the opportunity, if they miss something, they don't have the opportunity to, to go back and review. So a restatement is a way that we impress a major point on someone uh, by saying the same thing uh, using different words and in that way impressing the importance of a point on our hearers, uh, in, in our hearers mind. Let me give you an example. Uh, I was preaching a sermon once on, uh, on predestination and of course the, the a response for many people when you talk about predestination is to accuse God of injustice. Uh, 
And so I wanted to emphasize a point and make sure that it was a point that people didn't miss. So I used restatement for emphasis. And it came out, uh, but it's never right to accuse the God of heaven and earth of injustice. It's never right for the finite to pass judgment on the infinite. It's never right for the creature to condemn the creator. So you see, I said the same thing three different times, uh, but I used three different, uh, three different, three different formulations, if you will, of wording. I worded it three different ways, but I said the same thing three different times, and in that way impressed uh, a truth that I wanted to get across on a reader. So restatement is one way uh, to, to really uh, uh, fill out the truth and to emphasize the truth as you develop your sermon. Another uh, way you fill out your sermon is with, by defining and explaining uh, certain things. If you're preaching a sermon on Romans 3.25 and you're using the English Standard Version of the Bible, uh, you're going to come on the word propitiation. And so uh, part of the development of your sermon will be to actually define for your hearers what does the word propitiation mean. And, uh, and so that's another important way to, to fill out uh, your sermon with necessary information. You can fill out a sermon with uh, factual information. Uh, facts are observations, examples, statistics, uh, data that will verify the truth of what you're saying uh, from another source other than yourself. Uh, so, and it can also raise interest. Uh, statistics, for instance, uh, uh, preaching a passage, a sermon out of Genesis chapter 5, uh, which has a repeated statement throughout that chapter, Genesis 5, and he died, and he died, and he died. Um, I, I use statistics to talk about on average there are 1.78 deaths in our world every second. So that's 107 deaths every minute. 6,390 deaths every hour, 153,000 deaths every day, 56 million deaths every year, and then develop the idea that in fact we are all going to die and, and in terms of the need to prepare for that day. So statistics, factual information is, uh, is a good source for uh, again developing and filling in uh, a sermon and developing your sermon. Uh, quotations, uh, we use quotations from experts uh, to, to help people understand, again, to fill out and complete our sermon. Uh, use narration, you can, you can develop a sermon by, uh, by using narrative. Uh, this often works well, again, with narrative passages. You can preach a sermon about David and Bathsheba by perhaps taking on the role of David and as David reflecting on that sin and the impact that sin had on his own life and the life of his family. And so uh, narration is another means to develop uh, your sermon and to fill in and to fill out your sermon and present your sermon. Illustrations, of course, are important. Uh, uh, I've got a lot written in your notes about illustrations, and uh, we're not going to spend uh, a lot of time. I'm going to let you read through that. Uh, and so, uh, again, we just want to think about the things that are available to you. Once you have your outline, how to, how to f develop that outline into a full-blown sermon. There are just many things you can do and use. And, and that's what we've talked about. Restatement, definition, using facts, statistics, uh, using narration, using illustrations to, to develop the full-blown sermon. And, and, I, and I'll let you uh, read about that again in Robinson's book and think through those things. Uh, the final, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let's look at uh, yeah, step 10 then of developing a sermon would be then preparing the sermon's introduction and conclusion. Once you have uh, developed the body of your sermon, uh, then you're going to need to introduce your sermon and conclude. 
Usually these are things that are done uh, after the body of your sermon is complete. Uh, because until you have the body of your sermon, it's, it's hard to know what you're introducing. So the introduction is usually uh, crafted after the body of the sermon is complete, uh, although you can work on that introduction even as you develop the body of your sermon. Now, the purpose of an introduction is simple. There are three purposes. It is to uh, command attention. Uh, when you uh, when you, when you begin to preach, people will listen to you uh, out of a sense of obligation, uh, and that will be for about the first 30 seconds. Now, during that first 30 seconds, you need to work hard to gain the attention of your hearers. And, and you can do that by a good, solid introduction. Uh, a, a number of ways you can introduce a sermon to command attention you can use paradox, uh, a statement, something like, many children of God live as though they were orphans, uh, may create interest. A rhetorical question can capture interest early on. Something like, if it were possible for God to die, and he died this morning, how long would it take you to figure it out or to find out? Uh, maybe a question like, have you ever been disappointed with God? Questions can capture attention. Uh, a startling fact or statistic, again, can capture attention. Uh, again, the, the statistic I used earlier, almost two people die once every second. Uh, that can capture attention. Provocative statement uh, about your sermon text. If you're preaching Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, uh, you could say something like uh, uh, Matthew 1, 1 through 17 is a genealogy. It's also one of the most exciting passages in the Bible. Uh, again, people don't tend to think that genealogies are exciting, so that could create interest in uh, how is that an exciting passage. And of course, if you've studied through the genealogy in Matthew of Jesus, you discover it is, in fact, one of the most compelling and exciting passages of Scripture in terms of the lineage of Jesus Christ and who God uses and, and the lineage through which Jesus comes is a lineage of sinners like me and like you and, the, and, and uh, what that means for us as Christians. You can uh, capture attention by humor. Uh, a lot of people open sermons with humorous uh, statements. Uh, with certain biblical texts, you can capture attention just by reading the text. Uh, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. Uh, that's a statement, a sermon, just a direct scripture uh, quote that people will sit up and say, what's that mean and what's that all about? So you've captured attention just by that. Uh, you can introduce a sermon with a story. Introducing, say, a series on the book of Romans. You might use a story of of how the book of Romans impacted the life of Augustine and centuries later impacted the life of Luther and really uh, was the beginning of the Reformation. Later on, a century or two later, how Romans impacted the life of Wesley and then uh, talk about perhaps how this book of Romans might also impact your life and my life. So you can start with a story, a confrontational statement. You can capture attention in an introduction. A statement like, if you don't live for God, you don't belong to God. And, uh, and then uh, begin to explain that. So a confrontational statement will often actually anger people, but it will capture their attention. Uh, so the first thing you want to do with an introduction is command attention. Uh, they, will give you your, their, your atten they will give you their attention for the first little part of the sermon, but if you want to hold their attention throughout the sermon, uh, you need to capture their attention and give them a reason to listen. Uh, one of those ways we do give people a reason to listen is, is to uncover a need that this passage of Scripture that you're preaching on will address. So a, an effective introduction will uncover needs in a person's life that will compel that person to listen to your sermon. Uh, and so, uh, Hadden Robinson gives one example. 
that just in an, in an introduction asking a question like, can a woman work and still be a good mother? Uh, for a working mom who's a believer who wants to do the best by their children, uh, that will stir, uh, not just capture attention, but, but stir within them a need to hear the answer to that question. And they'll be with you through that sermon. Uh, another uh, a purpose of a sermon is simply to introduce the body of the sermon. So in your, in your introduction, you want to command attention. You want to uncover a need, if you can, touch a need in the life of your hearers that will compel them to listen. And you want to introduce uh, the body and the main point of your sermon. Or, so those are the purposes of a sermon. So again, uh, be creative in your introductions. There are many ways to introduce a sermon, many ways to capture attention. Which brings us then to our conclusions, uh, the conclusion of a sermon. Uh, Haddon uh, writes, uh, an able preacher understands that conclusions require thoughtful preparation. In fact, the conclusion possesses such importance that many ministers sketch it after they have determined the sermon idea and the purpose for a sermon. Whether or not you use that technique, you must work on the conclusion of your sermon with special care. Otherwise, everything comes to nothing. Like an able lawyer, a minister asks for a verdict. Your congregation should see your idea entire and complete and should know and feel what God's truth demands. So conclusions are, are critical. We've talked about developing and understanding the purpose of your sermon. Well, the conclusion is where you bring that purpose to bear on the lives of your hearers. So uh, conclusions can take a number of different shapes and, and you need to think through them and work on them carefully. Uh, first shape a conclusion of a sermon can take is a summary. In many conclusions, preachers will look back and restate the major points that have been covered through that sermon. And so uh, summarize what you have said in the sermon and, and then again uh, seek to apply the big idea of that sermon to uh, your, your congregation's lives. Uh, another way you can, uh, you can conclude a sermon is by an illustration that drives home the point, the big idea of the sermon. Oftentimes, an illustration will touch emotions in a way that just a straight statement of fact can't. So illustrations can be used powerfully uh, in a conclusion. Uh, some of the sermons can be concluded with a quotation and um, a, a fitting quotation that, again, summarizes and, and applies uh, the point, the big idea of the sermon. Uh, question. I find that oftentimes just asking a question at the end of your sermon can be a powerful way to conclude your sermon. Uh, an example, let me conclude where I began. Do you love God? And again, as, as they reflect on what's been taught uh, in your sermon, uh, that will bring back the, the message of the sermon and apply that sermon to their life. Do they really love God? If perhaps you've preached uh, that those who love God will make sacrifices for God. Those who love God will love his church. Those who love God will, will serve him. Those who love God will witness for Christ. If your sermon has contained those elements, then to ask that question, so do you love God, is a powerful way to end uh, a sermon. Uh, you can end uh, and conclude your sermon with a prayer. Uh, a prayer uh, can be a very powerful way to end a sermon. Uh, honestly asking God to help you and to help your church family apply the truth uh, to their own lives. Asking them to apply, asking God to apply the truth uh, to your hearers. And so uh, prayer can be a way to conclude a sermon. Specific directions. Uh, we can instruct at the end of a sermon uh, 
again, let's return to the example of if you preach a sermon on the need to reconcile with with other believers to whom you have a, a broken relationship with, uh, it, it's a it's a good thing to instruct at the end of a, such a sermon that if you have a broken relationship, uh, you as the Christian need to take the first step because this is what God requires of you. And perhaps you do need to make a phone call. You need to write a letter. You need to go see a person and and seek to reconcile with that person. Uh, and so giving just direct instructions based on the scripture passage is, is a powerful way to apply the sermon and to end the sermon. Uh, you can also uh, use visualization. Uh, sometimes we preach uh, a sermon passage that because of our circumstances is not applicable at the exact moment, uh, but it may become applicable. So you can help the congregation visualize situations where they might apply the truth that has been preached. Uh, for instance, uh, if uh, in our culture especially, you could, you could help them visualize a situation, say in regards to a coworker, and in the course of a conversation, your coworker says to you, well, you believe in gay marriage, don't you? And then ask your congregation to visualize that situation. How would you respond to that? Think through how you might answer that coworker as to why you don't believe in gay marriage and think through that in advance so that should that come up in a conversation with a friend, they've already visualized, they've already thought through how they might respond. And so visualization is a powerful way to end a sermon as well. Uh, so we have uh, I come to the end of, of our time together. And uh, again, uh, I know we've covered a lot of material and probably uh, done so in a way that's hard to absorb it all. I think my primary goal here has been to simply introduce you uh, to the ideas behind uh, oral communication, especially in regards to preaching, and to, to introduce you at least to the steps involved in preparing a sermon. And, uh, and hopefully you can go back, think through those steps, and, and use these notes that I've given you as kind of a guideline when you are called upon to, to present a Bible study or to present a sermon. Uh, I hope you'll find this helpful. Again, I would recommend that you, if, if preaching will be a regular part of your ministry, that you, you purchase a copy of Biblical Preaching by Haddon Robinson where he'll step you through these, uh, this approach to preaching, expository preaching, uh, and, and help you in developing your sermon step by step. Uh, I hope uh, that when you preach, you will preach expository sermons. I hope you will root your sermons in the text of Scripture itself. And I hope you always remember again the three things to keep in mind. And if you just remember these three things uh, and work towards these three things, you, uh, your sermons will be used by God and will be useful to God and will be effective. And that is unity. Make sure your sermon is marked by unity. That is that your sermon is developed one, around one central idea found in the text you're preaching. Second, that your sermon has a purpose, that you know why you're preaching, you know what response you're preaching for from those who hear. And then second, that, and then lastly, that you preach uh, with the idea that you want to help the people who hear apply God's truth to their own lives. So unity, purpose, and application. Keep those three things in mind and at the center, and, uh, and your sermons will be uh, powerful and useful to God. Uh, thanks. It's been great to be with you these last three months, and hope to see you again sometime.